Robert, and um, uh, good morning everybody on this uh, bright sunny day. Um, it's incredibly exciting for us. This is almost the culmination of a four year journey into building the world's first uh, rare earth processing hub. And we're building it uh, here in the UK at uh, a very important time for uh, rare earth permit magnets. And just to explain what they are, probably the biggest energy transition in history is this conversion from internal combustion engines to some form of electromotive power. That is, if you think about uh, a car, an electric vehicle, it's not actually the uh, lithium ion battery that makes it go, it's the electricity that goes into the axial motor that has a copper coil and a permanent magnet. So that's the, that's the electromotive force. And this sensational Saudi Arabia of wind that Boris Johnson talks about in the North Sea, that's actually only been facilitated by permanent magnets. Onshore wind turbines were actually common use motors with gearboxes. Gearboxes limited the height of onshore wind turbines because you have to basically put, be able to access the gearbox. The, the, the big change came when they, de they designed these what's called direct drive offshore wind turbines. And basically all these offshore wind turbines are is a copper coil being rotated inside seven tons of permanent magnets. And that means you've got no gearbox, you, you, there's no maintenance. They, they stay there for the life of the project. And that's why they're already at 260 meters high, 15 megawatts, and they're on the way to 20 megawatts and 30 megawatts per turbine, per turbine. This is how big they are. So this is the revolution, and this is a shock to a tiny, tiny market. The rare earth permanent magnet market is tiny. It's only about a $3 billion market. And suddenly electric vehicles come along, and offshore wind comes along, and suddenly start demanding these magnets. So you see these growth rates are, are off the scale, sort of 8%. And every time we do this slide, the growth rates accelerate. But we've got a problem. And the problem is that China dominates this sector. I mean, you've heard this before. Um, lithium hydroxide is a good example from the previous speaker. But most, most metals somehow find their way to China. China processes it. None more so than permanent magnets um, uh, it are actually permanent magnets and China said you need to wake up guys because we feel under no obligation to supply the rest of the world we're spending 11 trillion US dollars on our own offshore wind electric vehicles you guys want permanent magnets you need to go and sort it out yourself and then we've got this additional problem this uh, this additional shock to the supply system um, it's the Ukraine war. I was invited to the UK-US trade talks a couple of weeks ago in Aberdeen. On top of the list was supply chain resilience. People are saying, what happens if we have a supply shock like Ukraine? And in that case, it was more to do with wheat than it was to do with metals. How do we manage it? Well, in rare earths, there is no solution. Right now, China absolutely dominates that sector. And if we look at it sort of globally, um, there's really only three major players. There's an existing incumbent, that's Linus Corporation in Australia, which has got a mine in Australia, processing facility in Malaysia, and they basically supply uh, China and uh, North Asia. Then we've got this mine in America, in California, Mountain, it's the old Mountain Pass mine, now called MP Materials, they're coming on stream. And then there's us um, at Salt End. And just to sort of give you some metrics around that, Linus have got a market cap of six billion. Last year they did five and a half thousand tons of NDPR oxide and they spent over one and a half billion dollars building their project. MP Materials redeveloping the old mountain pass mine in California. They've got a market cap of seven billion. They're aiming to do six and a half thousand tons in 2024 and they've spent cumulatively over two billion. We're much lower than that, much smaller market cap because we're still emerging. But we, in terms of production, we're right up there with them. We're not far behind Linus at four and a half thousand tons in 2024. And the real win for us is our capital cost is significantly lower. We're only talking about $500 million worth of capital. And the reason being is we're taking advantage of one of the two things that I think the UK has got inherent advantages for right now and they are these legacy chemical parks and bad weather. And I'll talk about the bad weather later, but the legacy chemical parks, uh, and this particular one is, is the old, B, those of you in the oil and gas industry will know, it's the old BP Chemicals Park. 
and basically these have been sold off, ultimately ended up in the hands of private equity, and private equity has turned them into plug and play parks, basically saying we've got ports, infrastructure, reagents, chemicals, waste disposal, car parks, cafeteria, the whole bit, you just come along, plant your processing kit in the middle of that, we'll hook you up, and you don't have to pay for all the rest of the infrastructure. So that's one of the two reasons why our capital cost is orders of, orders of magnitude lower than our, than our competitors. Um, we're also, we, we also were teamed up with Associated British Ports and KPMG, and um, we lobbied on behalf of Humber uh, for the Freeport bid, and I'd like to say that uh, Humber was one of the best, if not the best bid, and uh, we've got the first half of the benefits from that. The first half of the benefits from Freeport is we get a whole bunch of business tax incentives, basically um, government incentives to locate our business in the Freeport. The second part of the benefit, that is the uh, custom zone approval, that's not there yet. We have to sort of twist, 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 Rishi Shunak, that's a hard thing to say, twist the arm of the Chancellor to be able to uh, persuade him to give the custom benefits. But the idea is, is to be able to import material tax-free, process it, and then export it tax-free. And this is what we, we aim to look like. We end up look to be the world's first, and we say independent, meaning independent of China, rare earth processing hub. So initially we have a mine in Angola in Africa, we'll bring material from there. We've got some transactions underway with resources in South America and some small resources in Europe that will be our feedstock. And then we just come, our commercial managers come back from Japan and Korea, which is our initial market. Um, and we've got some customers potentially in uh, Europe and then the big market will be North America. Um, essentially, we are creating a processing hub that will supply the world with the feedstock for these rare earth permanent magnets. Um, just to take it one step further forward, is to actually produce metal, you need quite a lot of electricity. So the area we're really excited about is the offshore wind. And uh, those of you are familiar with Dogger Bank, Dogger Bank's got these big turbines I'm telling you about, these are Hallyades X. 12 to 15 megawatts per turbine, they're actually being installed. They're not something in the future, they're being installed now. And that wind farm is being connected to a battery just north of Salt End, our processing plant, by an HDDC cable, high voltage direct current cable, that's being laid right now. So this offshore wind, cheap, low cost renewable energy, isn't something for the future, this will come online at the same time as we go into production. And just to give you some idea how excited we are about it, it's not just that we're getting zero cost electricity, zero. zero carbon electricity from it, these farms are producing negative electricity costs. And you say, hang on, how does that work? What happens is, because they are direct drive, they're actually hard to turn off. So once the wind's blowing, and there's not enough demand, say in the middle of the day, the wind farm operator actually has to pay the consumer to take the wind, take the electricity, negative electricity prices. We've just seen Bloomberg reported that they're asking a wind farm in Scotland to shut down. And uh, again, Bloomberg Green Energy Finance this morning reported the same phenomena is happening in, in Mongolia for the Chinese wind farm. So we're tapping into not just green energy, but seriously low cost energy to be able to convert our oxides into metal outside. Um, our mine is a primary source, is a mine in Angola in West Africa. It's um, very near surface, just the top 25 meters. It's a fabulous ore body. But what makes it really fabulous is sitting right next door to a $2 billion railway line, uh, the Benguela railway line, which connects the mine to the port of Lobito, which has not long been refurbished. And we're hooking into a 10 year contract for hydroelectric power at two cents a kilowatt hour. There's not many mines, not many businesses anywhere in the world get zero carbon, two cents electricity costs. So there at the mine site, we've got very, very low energy costs coming in, and we hope at, at Salt End we'll be able to tap into very, very low energy costs. Uh, this is the port of Lobito. Uh, often um, Africa gets, uh, African countries in Africa get criticised for not having infrastructure. Angola is sensational. Um, it ranked higher than Western Australia in terms of uh, legal, tax and infrastructure and, and that's one of the reasons why we're there.
So to put it all together, um, I've mentioned to you this demand side, uh, probably the most influential commentators on the sector is Adamus Intelligence. And they're saying in every year they put out a report and every year the forecast gets higher. So this is the most recent one. And they're basically saying that uh, the demand deficit in 2035 will be 15 times salt ends annual production. So you hear all these demand deficits from lithium and all these uh, other commodities, rare earths, neodymium and praseodymium oxide is very similar to that. Um, you may recall, may be aware of a number of automotive manufacturers, notably Tesla, and uh, you see many of the Europeans going directly to the mine sites for lithium. It's quite unusual that because it, because we all know the automotive manufacturing being the one industry that has just in time. Uh, my brother actually is a supply chain consultant for Mercedes and he talks about when the, the engines arrive at the factory, they don't stop moving, you just go onto the construction line into the car and the car comes off the other end. That's how just in time it is. So it's been a shock to the automotive um, manufacturers that lithium isn't necessarily immediately available by the Geiger factories. So they've reached upstream to the lithium companies and I know every lithium company is very popular right now because suddenly these are horrible OEMs who wouldn't normally talk to them are now, are now signing deals. So the most spectacular one I saw of late was Tesla actually signed a deal with um, an Australian company called Core Lithium who've got a, a very good, good deposit in the Northern Territory not even in production yet, not even in mine, not even in starting building yet, Tesla's already done a deal with them. Well, we kept saying the same thing for the last two years and saying, you think you've got a problem with lithium, all that's going to do is give you batteries. To make your cars go, you're going to need rare earth permanent magnets. So from January onwards, somehow the penny dropped and we've, uh, the, the phones rang off the hook. So rather than being the sort of uh, uh, unloved, uh, unloved bridesmaid, we're now getting some attention. And so we're now dealing with the, with the OEMs and really fascinating the conversations with them. They're now reaching upstream in exactly the same sets of companies doing the same thing. But it's quite interesting actually is that, um, and those of you might see there was an article in the Australian Financial Review this week by Evie Hambro, biggest mining investor in, in London. And Evie was saying there will be a premium for low carbon, zero, low embedded carbon product, whether it be lithium, whether it be rare earths, and transparency. And what he means by transparency, it's very, very hard to sell a Mercedes if you know that the cobalt that's gone into the battery has been mined by child labour. It just doesn't sell well in the forecourt. So the two things they're saying to us, show us transparency and show us your lowest possible embedded carbon. So all that stuff I was sharing with you about the electricity costs, yes, the cost of electricity is very low, but it's zero carbon, zero carbon. So we embed zero carbon into your product, that translates to, so ultimately, in Europe, we will buy products that will have a carbon rating on it, and that will determine a value of the car. And the measure of that is, this, we've got this thing called the carbon border adjustment mechanism, or the carbon border tax. That's starting off low with a, a group of metals and, and materials, but that's going to spread. And the OEMs can see it. So they're basically saying we need to have sources of materials that are transparent, independent, meaning non-Chinese, but also very, very low embedded carbon. And just to give you some scale, VW's one range of cars, they'll consume all of Sultane's production for a whole decade. The other area of demand that I would like to flag for you, which applies to rare earth magnets and to just about all the other metals, is this phenomena of robots. Um, we're about to hit robots, we're about to get rid of all that and do everything. And guess what they are? They're little servo electro motors with permanent magnets in them. So this hasn't hit yet, but when it does, that's potentially going to be even bigger than EVs because that's going to revolutionize. So massive demand coming through for the components. This is a snapshot of what we call our front-end engineering design. This is where we design the project to now. This is what we're going to break ground on in a few weeks. It's a $500 million project. It's got very, very uh, strong annual revenue and it's got the kind of EBITDA numbers that the lithium companies talk about. Um, very, very strong. And the kind of IRRs and paybacks you don't normally see associated with a, with a, mining, a mining company. 
Um, just a flag for you, we, we do have ambitions to be, we're listed on the standard list of the London Stock Exchange, we do want to ultimately become a, a premium list, so we're organising the board to reflect that. Um, Steve Sharp done eight billion dollars of resource financing, Baroness Northover was the ex-Minister of Trade for Africa, she worked with uh, the Angolan government. Jeremy Beaton um, built lots of things in his career, but he's more famous for the fact he was the Director General of the London Olympics. He reckons he built it on time and under budget. He claims he gave Gordon Brown $300 million back under budget. Now, one Scotsman giving another Scotsman money back, I don't believe, but he obviously did very well. Rob Kaplan is uh, um, ex-Petra. Uh, He's a bond finance guy. And then um, our star, if you like, Rocky. Rocky's probably one of the few people in the world who's actually built a rare earth separation plant. He's actually ex-Mountain Pass, our big rival. So. We've stolen the star to come and build our projects. And Tim George is ex-Anglo-American. He's uh, actually built and operated a business in Angola before. So that's it. I hope that was of, of interest to you and thank you very much for your time.